Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to be together as we celebrate the promises of God on this beautiful weekend. And so we welcome you. If you're with us virtually, we are grateful you are in our midst as well. Our call to worship comes from the psalmist this morning. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God. to join me in prayer as we confess our sins using the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. O oh God, when we are put to the test, we do not quickly respond. Sisters and brothers, the Lord's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven.
I invite you now to find the connection card in your bulletin to tear it out and fill it out. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. On the back of that card is a place for you to offer your prayers. If you check confidential, only our pastoral team will see it. Otherwise, our elders, deacons, and prayer teams will pray with and for you today and throughout this week. And for those of you worshiping online, we're glad that you're with us this morning. You have a connection card as well, just above the live feed. If you click that link and you can share your prayers with us there also. I have a few announcements for us this morning. Lots of great information on the back of the bulletin of things coming up in the life of the church, ways to be connected and engaged. And I'd like to draw your attention to just a few of them this morning. Um, the first one is our Massanetta family mission trip, August 8th through the 11th. Uh, we say family mission trip, um, but it's our church family. So if you are here and part of our church family, which is all of you, we want you to be there August 8th through the 11th. Uh, mark your calendar. We're putting together registration packets and information now to go out in the next few weeks. And we've made it really easy for you. You can go online and sign up, or you can send me an email. Or while you are here today, you can just check the box on the back of your connection card that says, I'm interested, send me more information. And then put that in the offering plate later in the service, and we will get you that information. While you're looking at your connection card, there's a second uh, opportunity for you to check a box and be engaged, and that is FPC 101. It's coming up on June 9th from 3 to 7 p.m. It's a, a class where we talk about the church, our mission, our calling, why we do the things we do, what it means to be a Presbyterian, answer any questions you may have. Dinner and child care are provided. So whether you're new to the church or you've been here for a long time, um, but you'd like to learn more and uh, possibly become a member, um, this is the class for you. So again, if you are interested, check the box and I will follow up with you uh, this week and get you signed up for that. And with that, sisters and brothers, I invite you to stand and to greet one another. not about the pool. I'm most excited about the fact that Scarlett had her baby, Scarlett in the preschool, and Scarlett wouldn't let me keep the baby. She took the baby home um, after church, and so I decided to hold this baby so I can tell you all about baby Cooper. Um, Scarlett is the girl that um, runs the preschool with me, and ever since she had a baby, I felt like I have had a baby, and so it's been so exciting for me to be a mom at 47 years old. Come on up, hey, come on. Um, and so today, Jim is going to be talking about a story in the Bible, come on. Um, in the book of John, where Jesus is teaching and he has, um, good job, Calvin. Um, and Jesus is teaching and he has somebody from the church, a Pharisee, which is a church leader, named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus would sneak out at night and he would ask Jesus questions. And you know what Jesus told Nicodemus, the church leader? He said that if you want to go to heaven, right, then you have to be reborn. You have to be born again in the Holy Spirit. And so I thought about the fact that Scarlett has a baby, and that's what it must be to be born again. Does it, you think it, he meant to be born again means to be like a baby again? Yeah. No, that's right, Tucker. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Good answer, Tucker. So when... Um, Jesus was teaching Nicodemus about how you are reborn, right? 
we accept Jesus into our heart and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that last week during Pentecost Sunday, right? And we are a new creation. So we're not a real baby. We get to start over again. And all the things that we did in our life, which were crummy, we get to start over and God makes us fresh in him. So we get to be just like Cooper, where we don't turn out to be babies, but we get to start over and be a wonderful creation in Christ. So I'm going to close this in prayer, and we're going to take pretend Cooper um, to um, Children's Church, and we're going to have the best time ever, and we will bring you back in time to go to lunch. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the fact that you have given us the opportunity to be a new creation in your son, Jesus, Lord, and we get to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are never alone, Lord. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to have a fresh start in you, Lord. We are thankful so much for your salvation, and we are thankful for all of those folks in the military who have watched out for us and those that have come before us as we celebrate Memorial Day. In your heavenly name. Amen. Let's go. Okay. While our kids are going off, I want to encourage you to get your Bibles open to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're going to look at the first 17 verses. It's on page 1064 if you're using a pew Bible. Um, and today, as we um, are in our Memorial Day weekend, we, um, we come in great gratitude for those who gave the last full measure of devotion. Um, for us in our lives so that we might have the freedoms to be able to worship here. I wonder if, uh, if, if, if you are currently active duty in our military, any of the branches of our military, or you are a firefighter or an EMT been in, or in the Peace Corps, would you please stand? Okay. If you are family members of anyone who is currently active duty, would you please stand? So everybody stay up if you're already up, if you're family members of someone who is serving. If you have a family, if you have served in the past or you have a family member who has served in our military, any branch of Peace Corps, EMTs, or firefighters, please stand. Okay. On behalf of a grateful nation, I want to thank you for the sacrifices and the willing to sacrifice that you've made so that we might have the freedoms for me to be here and for us to be gathered. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Okay, Gospel of John, first 17 verses of the third chapter. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people don't accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the word of the Lord. So I've been thinking about this sum, this word that's used all the time in our culture, word orientation, someone's orientation. And so I'm always intrigued by what words sort of originally mean, where they come from. I know that's not good grammar, but you know what I'm saying. And so I started looking at this, and it absolutely makes sense, right? The word orientation, most scholars believe, comes simply from the word orient which means east. Um, This sense that we are to look where the rising sun is, that that's the orientation. Now, if you know much about cartography, you'll realize that you'll you'll know that up until the last, it hasn't been that many hundreds of years that maps have always been oriented to the east, meaning that east was the top of the map. And then somewhere along the way, a few hundred years ago, we started shifting. I don't know if it's because we started to detect magnetic north, whatever it was, we changed it to north. So, so the sense of orientation itself is, is the direction in which you're facing. Now the truth is there are only two orientations. There are only two. And they come from, and let's see, well, this, I wouldn't say they come from this, but the easiest way to understand this is to to go back to two philosophers that actually knew each other. One was a teacher, one was a student. So we'll start with the student. The student was a man named Aristotle. Aristotle was a fascinating guy. But Aristotle's primary interest was in what he could detect and learn about the world as it is today. So he was one that was very much, he was a He taught uh, Philip of Macedon and actually Alexander the Great, his son. Um, And when Alexander the Great was out conquering the then known world, the story is is that he would send all these animals, all these plants, all these different things to Aristotle because Aristotle wanted to see how everything worked. He loved to dissect animals. He dissected bodies, actually. By the way, Aristotle believed that, for example, the brain was a cooling device. He thought it's what regulated our temperature. And if you look at it, you take the skull off, you know, it kind of looks like a radiator, right? So Aristotle had this real interest in in what is now and what's on this level of this world. Are we together? Even his philosophy of like teleology is what's becoming now in this world. He He was in a sense like a precursor to modern science. What can we know? How can we understand? What's it mean for us in our living today? <clears throat> His teacher, a man by the name of Plato, was very, very different. Plato, it's not that he wasn't interested, but Plato was not drawn to trying to understand different kinds of plants and how they might work or live together, or support each other. He wasn't so interested in <clears throat> dissecting animals and looking at musculature and all. Plato was much more oriented in a different way. Aristotle, horizontal, what's coming, what's coming, what's here, what can we see, sort of like modern science in a sense. Plato very much, what's really happening? The idea of, actually the word idea comes from Plato. Plato believed that there was a world of ideals where everything was perfect and everything down here was a a copy of what was perfect. Plato really believed that there was, <clears throat> there was something mysterious and mystical and in our understandings. Plato was, was much more the philosopher that asked the whys, meaning what's deeper, what's bigger than us, than the what's of like Aristotle. And these are the two basic orientations from which we choose, <clears throat> either to have a horizontal view, to look at what's next, to look at what we can understand now, what we can gather now, or to have a vertical view of being able to ask, what's, what's really going on? What's, the, what's why? What is it? Is there something bigger than us? <clears throat> now, I say all of this because it's critical to understand the story today. Because the exact same thing is happening in this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. <clears throat> Nicodemus, Scripture says to us, Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, 
who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Nicodemus was a powerful man. He was influential. He was probably quite affluent. He was a leader amongst leaders. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. A big deal. He was a Jew of Jews. He understood the law. He more than likely had everything memorized. He lived in that realm. Here's this man who has this sort of horizontal way of living and looking, who comes to Jesus. He comes at night. Now, some people think he comes at night because he's afraid he doesn't want others to know. Maybe. It's also possible that he comes at night because that's the time that most people went to honor teachers or rabbis. And he says to Jesus, he says, Rabbi, which is just a Hebrew word for teacher. This is not special. He says, teacher, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come, a rabbi who has come from God. For no one can perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So Nicodemus is coming to Jesus and he's saying, you're doing some really interesting stuff. I want to know what that is. I want to try to understand what you're doing in this level. How, are your, how does it fit? And Jesus replies to him. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. So Jesus immediately shifts it. Like horizontal thinking, like what's, what are you doing? Let me help you understand that. Let me see the miracles. Let me hear the teachings. And Jesus says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Jesus immediately looks up. Jesus has this vertical understanding. And so Nicodemus responds, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Nicodemus keeping it here. Now here's a little play that you wouldn't know. It's, it's unfortunate that it's not translated like this. So the phrase that Jesus is using, born again, is the same phrase born from above can be translated that either way. You can translate it born from above <clears throat> or born again. Nicodemus takes it as born again because he's living in this sort of horizontal life. Jesus instead takes it and says, no, it's not about being born again. It's not about entering into the womb again. It's about entering into the kingdom of God. It's about being born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, he says, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. It's about being able to see something that is bigger than us. So you get this law, you get the teacher, you get this born again in Nicodemus. And in Jesus, you get the spirit, the kingdom of God, born from above. And then Jesus goes even further and he tells a little piece of a story to Nicodemus. I don't know if you noticed it. He says this to him. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life in him. <clears throat> Same thing happening here. So you remember the story, let me, let me tell you. 21st chapter of Numbers, Moses is with the people in the wilderness. And they've gone from Mount Hor along the, the Red Sea and they're going around Edom, so they're, they're, they're in the wilderness. And the people grew impatient of that way. Didn't seem like the direct way. And the Bible says they spoke against God and against Moses. And they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. They bicker, they, they, they just are complainers constantly. So when they complain and they speak against God and Moses, the next verse says, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. Don't bicker with God, by the way. Whoa. So what's Moses do? Moses does what Moses always does. He is like the most patient pastor ever. Everyone bickers against him. They want to replace him. They want to kick him out. They bicker against his God. He always is patient. And so what he does is he goes and he prays for them. He prays for his people. And the Lord says to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. 
So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Every one of you have seen this every time you go to a pharmacy. <clears throat> We've all seen this. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. <clears throat> so there's this power of this bronze snake on the pole that Moses would hold up. The people would see if they were bitten by these venomous snakes and they would live. It's a beautiful, powerful story about God prolonging life, about God bringing healing, about, about, about the power of God, right? <clears throat> so Jesus takes that, but he twists it. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now Jesus is the Son of Man. He's speaking of himself. And he says, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, meaning that Jesus on the cross and what he did for us, the sacrifice of his life needs to be lifted up over us. The Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So you see what Jesus does? <clears throat> Any doctor who measures their effectiveness by um, mortality rates, right? I mean, any doctor who considers them a themselves a success because someone keeps living ultimately is a failure. Every single patient is going to die sooner or later. Right? Are we together? <clears throat> Same thing here. What does Moses do? He holds up the snake. People are bitten. You know, they, people are bitten. They're going to die. Holds it up and they live. But all of those people died. They're living in this world. They die. That happens. Jesus says, no, it's the Son of Man now. And when he's lifted up, everyone who believes in him will have eternal life in him. So he's going vertical. Now our orientation matters in our lives because we are always, think, we are always tempted to be horizontal thinkers. We're always tempted to worry about what's coming next. <clears throat> what's gonna happen next? What are we gonna do next? What do we need to be prepared for? What do we have to think through? What matters? It's like we just, we get into it. We just start, we start to, we get drawn into it. And this, so it just starts to become day by day by day. And we put our head down and we kind of focus on what's there. <clears throat> I ran into someone, a friend that I hadn't seen for a few years. Um, the last time I saw him, he had a baby in his arms. And when I ran into him this week, he's got his little baby now was about four or five, a little boy. And I said to him, I said, Kevin, you know, time flies. And he looked at me and he said, maybe for you, but not for me, Jim. <laughs> it ain't flying at all for me right now. I know I may look at it at some point and it flies, but it ain't flying right now. I'm just doing the best I can, just getting through. Are we together? So, so this is the temptation that we have, is, is to just think about what's, what's coming next. What, what am I going to do next? What happens next? Where? And Satan wants you to be there. Because the adversary knows if he can keep you horizontal, if he can keep that thinking about what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, if he keeps you focused on that, he will keep you overwhelmed. And he will have complete power over you. Now we're tempted to do the same thing in our relationship with God. To have this horizontal relationship with God. I cannot, let me make sure I see who everybody's here. Okay, none of you. This doesn't apply to any of you. <laughs> this is true though. I really mean this. I cannot tell you how many times people have come to me to meet with me who were maybe, well, just people. And they're in a great need. The MRI, the blood work, the biopsy, the abandonment, the lost relationship, the, the job that failed, the, the dire places of life. And I can tell you that really I think without exception, I've had so many people come in those situations and say simply this, if God does this, if God heals me, 
If God restores this relationship, if God gives me this relationship, if God gets me into the school, if God, if God does this, I will believe in him and his power and I will serve him forever. And I can't tell you how many times that's actually become true that God did heal, that God did restore or God did redeem or God did offer something new. God provided for them. And out of those 100% of people who say that when they come, and when that happens to them and when they receive that, you know what percentage actually do believe long term? I think about 10% in my experience. It's not because they're bad people. It's not because they don't even believe. But I think it's because they are just living in this world. What can God do now? What will God do now? What will God do now? And rather than being able to lift up our eyes and see something, we just keep going and we keep going. And well, this, this was healed here, but, but now I'm in this. Now I'm in this. Now I'm in this. And you see, the adversary just wants you to be overwhelmed with the day to day. <clears throat> because when that happens to us, thinking about the next thing, thinking about the next thing, then he'll always have power. And that's what he wants us to think about our God. So what Jesus does is Jesus says, look up. <clears throat> There's so much more. It's not even about being born again. It's not even about having something renewed now. It's not about a restoration. It's not about a new journey. It's not about a new gift. But look up. It's about being born from above. Look up and see joy and meaning. And peace, peace that is not measured by a lack of conflict, but peace that is measured by, by sweetness and, and grace. And most importantly, Jesus says this. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake to heal people for the time being, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. He says, look, look through my death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Look through my death and see not simply what I did for you, not that I died for your sins, not just the what, but see why I did it. See why I did it. See the depth of my love for you. See the power of my life for you. Does this mean we shouldn't be concerned about the horizontal? Absolutely not. I'm a planner. I get that. We should always be. But here's the point. We're called to see what's really there. And for us, nothing is truly what it is until we look up and we see it for what it really is. <clears throat> so I, I like to read, and, um, and I have certain things that I go back to a lot. Um, so, <clears throat> for example, and I have seasons that I read. So, for example, if I decide I want to read something Russian, like Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, um, I've, I've learned in my life that you only read Dostoevsky in the summer. Because if you read him in the winter, you will enter into the deepest depression of your life. <clears throat> it's just dark, dreary Russian stuff, right? Read him in the summer and you're like, whoa, it's sunlight, and like, whoa, there's something powerful here. So. I kind of started flipping back through, going back to the Brothers Karamazov, which is 17,850 pages, I think. It's some massive Russian thing. But it is one of my favorite books. And there's a story that's told in it that you can take out of, out of its context. It's actually the most, the most popular or well-known chapter that Dostoevsky ever wrote. It's called The Grand Inquisitor. Now, <clears throat> the story is set in sort of 18th century Russia, but, but it, it's told as a, a fable from 1600s in Spain. And here's a simple story. This is a little synopsis. It's Russian. It's a long chapter. But here's what happens. <clears throat> Jesus comes back to Spain in the 1600s. And he starts walking along, and people are being healed as he passes, and he starts teaching, and he's doing Jesus stuff, right? So Jesus is back. The church finds out that Jesus is back. They know it's Jesus, not an imposter. It's Jesus. And so the church arrests him. And they put him in prison. And then the Grand Inquisitor, who's kind of like the big bishop, comes and visits Jesus in prison. And he sits down. Jesus seated there in the prison cell. 
And this bishop, the Grand Inquisitor, says to Jesus himself, you were completely wrong, you messed everything up the first time, and you should never have come back the second time. We have spent 1,600 years correcting what you did. You talked about having free will and people being able to choose, and we all know that human nature will never work with free will. If you choose, you're always going to choose poorly, you're going to choose wrong, you're going to be dead. You're, it's, it's, it's a terrible idea. So what we've done is we figured out that the best way for people to live is to have rules and laws and order. And we have created a society that does that. And look at how far we've come from your time when you were here and did the bad stuff to where we are now. Look at all the development. Look at all the advances. Those came because we as the church said, nope, you have no control over your lives. You do what you're told to do. You live the life we tell you to live, and that's the best life for you. He goes on and on and gives example after example. He talks about Jesus' temptation and where Jesus should have answered Satan, that Satan was right and Jesus was wrong. He goes through all of this. And at the very end of it, the most interesting thing happens. At the very end of it, the entire time, Jesus has never opened his mouth. In fact, Jesus never speaks in the entire chapter. But after the Grand Inquisitor is over and tells Jesus how wrong he was and how he should never have come back, he shouldn't have even been here in the first place, Jesus gets up and he walks over to the Grand Inquisitor and he kisses him. And thousands of dissertations have been written on the meaning of that. I'm not sure what Dostoevsky meant. But I know for me, there's something about the power of this God when we look up. A power of love and forgiveness and redemption and a power of touch. I think what Jesus does when lips touch the face of the Grand Inquisitor is Jesus tells him that you are still in relationship with me even if you don't want. You are still in relationship. I still love you. This Friday I had an unplanned encounter <clears throat> with a young woman who is, um, she graduated college last year. She's smart and successful and bright and attract. She just, she's just a wonderful person. And this last week, something happened in her life that was absolutely devastating. And I sat down with her, and here's this woman who's just all put together and sharp and smart and all these things, and almost intimidating for me, like, wow, you're so... <clears throat> and she began to talk about her life, really since early childhood, really almost from infancy. And she began just to talk about the things that she had gone through with her family, people that she loved and people that loved her, but the pain and the loss and the pain and the loss and the pain and the loss. And, and as she kept talking and she just kept walking through all of these things, I, I began to tremble. Not trembling out of fear or worry, but honestly kind of trembling out of how in the world could someone who have gone through this and this and this, some of the most horrific things I can imagine in life and in relationship and in family, how could she still be so, so bright and vibrant and, <clears throat> and alive? It was almost as if I felt I was in the presence of, of the holy. How in the world? And as she began, continued to talk, and it came to me, it was like a gift from above for me in my life. Saying, Jim, you know how she's stayed faithful. You know how she's done this. It's not because she's stronger than you. It's not because she's more faithful than you. It's not. It's simply because she's never let her eyes shift from looking up and seeing my love. No matter what the world threw at her at every corner, she was still filled with this deep, amazing love. A love not simply for her God, but 
a love for those that are around her, a love for those who were unable to care for her, a love for those who, who were This is the key for us in our lives, my friends. If we keep our head down and we keep dealing with this is coming and this is coming and this is coming and this is coming, whether it be good or bad, our heads stay down and all we see is the next thing and all we fret and worry about is what's coming and what's next, what's next. When instead what Jesus wants is he wants us to look up and he wants us to be in relationship with him and with each other. So Nicodemus shows up again in the Gospel of John. Actually, shows up twice. The last time he shows up is fascinating to me. <clears throat> so he comes. He's influential. He's most likely amazingly affluent. He's got it together. He's a who's who. He comes and visits, visits Jesus. He's looking at it this way. He doesn't seem to change. He doesn't have like an aha moment. He just kind of goes away until Jesus dies. <clears throat> and when Jesus dies, the Gospel of John says... Two men, Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man that has an available tomb, and Nicodemus go to the authorities and say, will you give us the body of Jesus? And the authorities do. And in the Gospel of John, it's not the women that go on the Sabbath to anoint his body. In the Gospel of John, it's Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, two influential and prominent men, go and do what no other man in Judaism would do ever. They take 70 pounds of ointment with them, and they must have spent hours putting that ointment on the dead body of our Savior, <clears throat> anointing him for his burial. And there again, the touch. Just as Jesus kisses the Grand Inquisitor, <coughs> just as this young woman can keep her eyes and her touch on her Savior, just as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea anoint this body, this is the key for us, is to stay in touch. Touch with, with our God, to look up, to see. And then be able to share and to live and to be. This is the call for our lives. And the truth is, you have a choice today. Every single person has a choice of your orientation. You can continue to look this way and worry and fret about what's coming next and what's going to happen in my life or what's going to happen in the world. You might not know, probably most of you don't really realize this, but it's an election year. Um, <clears throat> So it doesn't matter which candidate, you're, which party, everybody's doom and gloom because if we're not, all this stuff, right? All this stuff, I mean, it's like, and it's so easy, and I get it. I mean, I rode past a carnival this last week, and I looked over to Cheryl and I said, boy, I wish, I wish my grandkids were here because I'd take them to that carnival. And lo and behold, a girl was shot and killed right there yesterday. I get it. It's so easy to, to just, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Or I worry, I worry, I worry. It's so easy. But my friends, there's something more. I'm not minimizing that. I'm not taking away from that. But there's so much more. There's a love. There's a touch. There's a power that says it's not just this life. But when the Son of Man is lifted up, whoever believes in him lives forever. This is who we are. Let's make the choice today. Look up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Friends, we have the opportunity to look up in response. Yeah, there we go. We, uh, we have the opportunity to look up to our Savior in response to His word and faithfulness. And we do that in a number of ways, with our tithes, with our offerings, and with our prayers. So at the moment, our ushers will come forward and pass the plates. And as they do, I encourage you to place your offering in it as it goes by, along with your connection card, um, with your prayers and your responses. <clears throat> for those of you worshiping online, there's an opportunity for you to participate as well. If you click the link just above the live feed that says Give, um, you can participate in that way. You can also text to give by texting the number 530 
Sisters and brothers, let us continue to worship our Lord.
Gracious Father, for all of the blessings you pour out upon us, we give you thanks. We ask that you accept these gifts of our tithes, of our offerings, of our prayers and our lives, and use them in mighty ways to build your kingdom here on earth as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. be seated. And as we turn now to a time of prayer, we lift up prayers for our world, for peace and for ends to violence in places like Israel and Gaza and Ukraine. In our own nation, as it is Memorial Day weekend and we celebrate, we pause and reflect prayerfully with gratitude all of those who gave the last full measure of devotion and service to our nation. In our own city, we are thankful for the opportunities we have as a church to serve as the hands and feet of Christ in our neighborhoods. And in particular, this week, we are thankful for our soup kitchen, which served 59 guests yesterday. We continue to pray for our confirmation class as they are entering the the phase of their journey where they prepare their statement of faith and answer that question that Nicodemus and Jesus were talking about and what it is that they believe. So we hold them in prayer as they enter this season. We hold all of the groups that will be starting the book study next week as we begin our new sermon series in prayer that the Lord meet them and build relationships in these new, uh, new opportunities. And as a reminder, our sermon series is Re- Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. We have books available by Mark Comer. If you're part of a group and you need a book, you can purchase one. Also, if you'd like to read the book on your own and follow along as we uh, journey through this summer of removing hurry. We also have a devotional guide that goes with the book. It looks like this. These are available for free in the narthex and in the commons as well. Um, We encourage you to be part of this study this summer. We lift up prayers for the friends and family of Richie Fugere as we mourn his loss. Richie passed away on Thursday evening. Um, For those of you who worship at the contemporary service from time to time, you'd know Richie. He was the guitarist that led us in worship um, many Sundays. We will share details about a service of witness to the resurrection as they become available. We lift up ongoing prayers for Chris McKinnon Hing, her husband Zach, her parents Pat and Colin, for Tom and Lynn Jones, and for Tom Celeste and Phelan Hadaway. We bind up all of these prayers and the prayers we received through our connection cards last week as we go before the Lord in prayer. Sisters and brothers, let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the glorious opportunity that we have to gather together to look up to you. Jesus, to look upon your face, to glorify you, to sing your praise. And although we face the temptation in our daily lives to simply put our heads down, to simply grit our teeth and to get through life sometimes, to let the busyness, the chaos, the despair, the challenges of this world keep us preoccupied. We thank you for the reminder, for the calling to look up, to look upon you. And we ask that as we continue on uh, this day and in the coming days, that you continue to remind us to look upon you, to not live a horizontal life, but a vertical life, a life that reflects the kingdom, the hope, the love, your forgiveness, your grace, and a world that's full of despair and hopelessness. Let us be a reflection of your light, Jesus. And as we go out this day, Lord, we are reminded that we go not alone, but as your hands, your feet, as your body, as your people, and as your people, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven.
you're worshiping with us for the first time, we've got a little gift for you. It's a little book by Rick Warren called What on Earth Am I Here For? It's about purpose and meaning in life, and it's free. You don't have to sign anything or shake a hand. We just love to give it to you. There's books up uh, in a little table up against the wall in the narthex out that way. If you come this way for coffee and donuts or snacks, whatever we have, um, there's a larger table, and we'd love for you just to take it. If you want to hold up anything in prayer, our prayer team has been praying for us throughout our time in our sanctuary. They'll be on this side, uh, my left, your right, in the transept. So please take the opportunity to hold up anything in prayer. And now, sisters and brothers, live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily, and leave everything to the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.